Hey everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. Tonight we're going to have our third part of our conversation with Bishop Timothy Mansfield. We're going to talk about psychology and spiritual practice and how those two are related or unrelated. We're going to talk about spiritual materialism and how people can abuse spiritual practices and traditions uh, simply in order to make themselves feel better. We're going to talk about some spiritual practices that you can do, including chanting the Psalms and some ascetic practices. And then we're going to segue into a conversation towards the end about uh, queer issues and uh, Gnosticism and how various attitudes towards the body affect uh, a Gnostic worldview. So stick around, you're going to want to watch all that coming up on Talk Gnosis. Bishop Tim, uh, you've said in the past that uh, when many people start in a uh, spiritual tradition, maybe a new spiritual tradition, they're kind of drawn to the to the aspects or the practices or the things that uh, that may not be good for them. What, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, it's probably, I probably said it more universally than I, than I really meant it. <laughs> but um, I think sometimes people are drawn to there's a couple of different levels. Sometimes people are drawn to spiritual life um, because they're in psychological distress and they're looking for something which can help soothe the psychological distress. But soothing psychological distress and spiritual growth are quite distinct paths. And if you're in a lot of psychological distress, I take a first aid approach. You need to deal with that first. Um, you need to do whatever it is, is, is needed in your life to take care of, of what's distressing you most psychologically. And when that's underway and you feel like you're in a place of stability, that's a good place to start spiritual work. Um, that's a huge topic because when I say psychological distress, it covers a multitude of things, but I think it's a real issue that because there's such a crossover between spirituality and psychology because it, traditionally these things weren't differentiated at all it's a modern thing to differentiate them um i think we're not particularly literate as a culture on what's one kind of problem and what's the other kind of problem so that's one thing um is that people come into spiritual work and they're looking for something which will soothe and um comfort them at a psychological level which is fine i mean go right ahead but but really there's probably more effective ways to deal with your issues um and in the long term, if you stick with the things that are soothing, that might not be the things which are going to um, trigger spiritual growth or move you further along in your spiritual journey, I, I believe. So that's the one thing. Sec question? I was just going to interject that we did a show a few years back on spiritual bypassing, uh, an entire episode on it. So it, and uh, it, it's worth a review, uh, I think. So I, I was about to bring it that up too yeah and i thought that was a particularly you know powerful and interesting show um and it was the first time i had been introduced to the concept mm -hmm. uh and uh and i've of course found it very useful in my my own life so uh yeah. sorry uh continuing excellency yeah massively it's massively important and we're all doing it right like yeah. <laughs> yeah. we're doing it right six. now <laughs> yeah <laughs> spiritual bypassing is not something other people do it's something that we're all doing um, yeah, that's why I found it, so interesting. It broadly, I mean, in a way, it, it broadly fits. So Chogyam Chungpa, who's a Buddhist teacher in the in the 70s and 80s, um, had this idea, this concept that he kind of um, invented for talking to Westerners called spiritual materialism. And spiritual bypassing is a kind of spiritual materialism. Spiritual materialism is when you use spiritual practice as a way to gain something in your conventional life. So it's either to feel better or to feel nice or to make your anxiety go away or... Um, uh, hang out with cool people, get nice yoga pants that you can, whatever, right? So it's anything where you're co-opting since, um, you know, by, by many accounts, spiritual life is fundamentally about liberation from the, the goings on of your ego into um, union with the divine in, is what we'd say, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's not really about making your conventional life more, you know, cushy and comfortable, mm -hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. Father Thomas Keating said in an interview once, you know, if you're successful in spirituality, then you can look forward to, um, you know, social exclusion, <laughs> social exclusion, probable torture, maybe exile. And if you're really successful, then death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, we, if, we look at the, if we look at the lessons of Christian tradition. Yeah, um, the, the Gospels are pretty, are pretty straight up about that. You know, Jesus doesn't really mince any words. <laughs> 
it's, uh, it's gonna be if tough. you follow it's his path, trouble. you'll probably end up on a cross as well. Yeah. yeah, hopefully that's not the case anymore. But um, yeah. So the, the one thing is, okay, so spiritual bypassing, you know, and, and all the, the kind of epiphenomena around that of, of, of kind of displacing to what's intense spiritual practice, what's better handled by psychology, um, I think is one of the things that's behind me saying often people are drawn to things that aren't in the, you know, aren't going to do the best for them. The other thing is that often I think, um, you know, we tend to go to what's towards what we like mm-hmm. and we tend to avoid what's uncomfortable. It's just that's being an organism. Mm-hmm. And look, we're like we're back talking about the physical body, really, aren't we? <laughs> um, so when we come into a spiritual tradition, there's aspects of it that we're quite drawn to, and there's aspects of it that probably deter us or repel us, or we find very difficult. Um, now, so sometimes the things that we're deterred from are the things that w- would be most valuable for us. Um, we talk a lot about, or, you know, one of the examples that comes up in the AJC context a lot is. Uh, the use of the Psalms, chanting the Psalms, using the Psalms in the divine office, stuff like that. Um, a lot of people are repelled by the Psalms because uh, a lot of the verses in the Psalms are, are very violent and aggressive and um, talk well, about emotions. You mean emotions. they don't like smashing babies against the rocks? I don't understand. Right, right. Crush the skulls of my enemy's children against stones and yeah. you know grind them at your feet, O oh Lord. Um, it's harsh, right? And for mm-hmm. most people, when they've bought into this whole idea of, of the demiurge, you know, then... Um, then for them, the Psalms are addressed to the Demiurge. So then why are we chanting these prayers to the Demiurge? What's that really about? Um, okay, so there's a lot of, there's a whole show about chanting the Psalms, I'm sure, sitting back in the Torknosis archives, but there's a lot of reasons why it's useful and interesting to invoke those very difficult emotions and to, to pray with them and work with them and surrender them over time. If you're deterred by feeling icky about it, when you never try that stuff, you'll never get to to realize what, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of Benedictine practice um, has borne fruit in the lives of Benedictine monks and nuns. Uh, you'll never get to see any of that in your own life. You won't get to benefit from it because you're deterred by the ick factor, I guess. Yeah. So that's the second way in which I think people are, you know, early on. Mm-hmm. I'm very, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little obsessed with a, a Jesuit writer from the 18th century called Jean-Pierre de Cossard. And Cossard talks about two phases in spiritual life, one in which um, God lives in the soul and one in which the soul lives in God. And in the first phase where God lives in the soul, it, he says it's very important. He's writing to nuns and he's saying it's very important to, to stay with the disciplines, to do what you're told, to be obedient, you know, to go to the office and to uh, take on the task that you're, you're handed and, um, you know, to be good. But then, you know, eventually the soul wakes up in God. You, you attain the early stages of divine union. And then God tells you what to do. And the, the rules don't really apply. You're drawn to what it is you need. And your soul draws you to read what you need, to pray how you need, to be where you need to be. And you need to obey those. those um, you need to heed those, um, how does he put it? Heed those impulses or heed those... Um, yearnings because that's the truth of god speaking mm. i could I, I almost always get god lives in the soul and the soul lives in god the wrong way around so mm-hmm. go read de cossard c-a-u-s-s-a-d-e he's awesome cool well we'll try to link him in the uh the show notes for this um bringing it uh obviously we you did just address the body in in that uh in that question that answer but bringing it back a little bit more solidly. Previously, on a previous segment uh, for the show, we were talking about asceticism. So I, so I have a question for both of you. Actually, more for Father Tony, if that's okay. But uh, mm-hmm. what, what does Secret John say about asceticism, Father Tony? Or what have you drawn out about asceticism? Well, yeah, I think it's more appropriate to say drawn out than what it says outright. It, it, um, it strongly... Uh, well, let's say it, it, it's very clear on what it doesn't like about being embodied in the physical universe. I, I want to actually quote um, uh, Dr. Karen King here from her fantastic work, The Secret Revelation of John. So um, she says, Christ's revelation exposes transient beauty, food, material wealth, and lust for what they are, imitations of divine creativity and spiritual nourishment intended to lead 
humanity astray by keeping them tied to the ignorance and moral evils of bodily passions. Their life, quote-unquote, is in fact death. Their pleasures, quote-unquote, are the spirit-destroying bonds of passion and suffering. So while it doesn't say, it doesn't give a, a formula, you know, like uh, fast for three days or, you know, whatever. It, um, and, and there very well may have been in the um, Sethian community or the community that used this, uh, this material, there may have been actual practices and, and, and ritual asceticism involved, but the text itself doesn't uh, prescribe that directly. So I wrote a post about it. Um, over a year ago now, gosh, that was a long, <laughs> um, where I kind of <laughs> tried to tease out what, um, what an asceticism based on the Apocrypha of John might look like. And that's kind of what I practice in my own personal uh, spiritual work, uh, more or less successfully, depending on, you know, day of the week and <laughs> that kind of thing. So anyway, so I, I think that's specifically what... Um, what the, the secret book of John talks about. And again, it's, you do have to tease it out of the text a little bit, but the, it, does, it does make it pretty clear that, you know, food is a problem and wealth is a problem and lust is a problem and, and uh, whatever the fourth one is. Yeah, right. beauty. So we'll, we'll also link that post uh, in, in the show notes as well. But uh, uh, the, sorry, did you say beauty as well? Yeah, so beauty. Like, yeah, beauty. Um, which I take, I take to mean something like vanity, but um, you know, your uh, your mileage may vary. I'm, I'd be excited to hear what what people uh, what people think about it. Right. So and to clarify, I mean, you already said it twice, but Secret John does not give a list of these are the things <laughs> right. you should be ascetic about. Yes. But a careful reading of the but text. But I did. <laughs> 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 because um, I know better than the author of the Secret Book of John, that's for sure. No, but I should make it clear. I, I you, wrote that you, post you for wrote me. A much better, you wrote a much better listicle than the author of the Secret well, Book of John. Well, that is true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, and I wrote that for me. I, I, you know, I wrote that as a, you know, this is what I'm going to try for a while, and, you know, people are welcome to try it or not or adapt it or whatever, but the, it's um, just based on, on my own needs at the time. Um, and, and I think um, I, I think you're in good territory there because Secret John does seem very deliberate. Um, so there is a lot to be drawn out of it, right? So mm -hmm. uh, there doesn't seem to be anything there uh, uh, on accident. I find it quite interesting, you know, that mystery of exactly where the body comes from. It's not quite said in Secret John, and there probably was a reason for that. So we can either invent a reason. <laughs> well, try let to me read that it. to you, actually, because it is m one of my favorite lines from the book. And this is from the um, Frederick uh, Wisse. I don't know how to, mm. how to say German words, but um, from his translation. Uh, Yet again, they made another from earth, form from Earth water, fire, and spirit, which is from matter, darkness, desire, and the adversarial spirit. This is the chain. This is the tomb of the molded body with which they clothe the human, the fetter of the flesh. He is the primal one who came down and the primal partition, but it is the, it, but it is the thought of primal light who dwells in him and who awakens his thinking. So I, I just love the symbolism there, the chain and the tomb. And <laughs> like, mm -hmm. these are people who had pretty strong opinions <laughs> about the nature <laughs> of the body. Um, yeah, and, and probably these, these people probably smelled funky and they probably, you know, <laughs> probably had some, uh, you know, rough clothing and, and whatnot. I've, I've met that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Your Excellency, do you, do you have thoughts and reflections on kind of queer issues and the body and Gnosticism. Like, uh, I think that, you know, we had a past guest who said that Gnosticism is more trans-friendly because, you know, in, in many Gnostic views, we're not, we're not our body, right? Um, so that, again, this isn't really a question. It's kind of a what's up with that. <laughs> but do you, do you have kind of um, some, any reflections between LGBTQ uh, issues uh, and experiences, the body, and Gnosticism. So there's a little triangle uh, to, to get you thinking. And if you don't, we, we still have more questions. <laughs> I got a couple. I mean, um, I mean, my view might be a little controversial because I, I kind of feel like 
we make a lot of fuss about sexuality and spirituality. Um, predominantly straight people make a lot of fuss about sexuality and spirituality. Um, I kind of feel like they're distinct realms of human experience that, you know, have a lot less to say to each other than we seem to believe they do. You know, the, the upset in mainstream um, Christian circles around who's gay or lesbian or queer or bisexual or transgender and who's not, let alone which bathroom they're allowed to use. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I nurse fond hopes that in a hundred years time, maybe less, you know, we'll look back on this period and go, wow, that was a weird thing to get really obsessed by. Like, what's up with that? Um, so that, that, there's a thing. There's another thing, which I think um, any type of spirituality which gets overly obsessed with heteronormative narratives. Um, so for those of you that don't spend weekends reading gender theory, mm. when I, <laughs> yeah, or, or, or spend it on Tumblr. <laughs> or spend it on Tumblr. Um, <laughs> why, ways to learn bad queer theory, go to Tumblr. Um, heteronormative means making an assumption that, that heterosexuality is, is um, a, a kind of a universal norm. Um, you know, uh, heterosexual people, when they talk in spiritual terms, often do. There's, a, there's often an assumption that it's normal for things to be divided into the masculine and the feminine, for there to be a sacred, creative, interpenetrative dance in which the feminine displays itself in all of its glory and is penetrated by the masculine, um, the, the divine spirit of God, you know, just penetrating the feminine earth and creating, you know, it's lovely imagery. Um, and perfectly normal, of course, because, you know, we were on this planet because most of our ancestors, you know, <laughs> engaged in just such procreative acts. Yeah. So perfectly reasonable. However, the trouble is that if you're not heterosexual and the, the bulk of your um, your erotic life, your love life, your sense of your sexuality doesn't fall into that neat masculine feminine divide, then any narrative which makes it sound like um, that's a universal truth for all human beings leaves you feeling excluded and shut out, I think. So that's the, that's the problem with heteronormativity. Um, in general and particularly in spiritual life. So um, I think one of the strengths of Christianity as a whole is that it just doesn't talk about sexuality very much in particular. So there's sort of space. Um, I think the particular genius of um, Gnostic stuff and and the NHL books, Secret John, um, The Reality of the Rulers, various other things, is they're, they're, they're pretty queer. They have very weird ideas about gender. Um, Barbalo's the mother father at one point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, various characters have ambiguous genders or I think there's even some gender changing. There's sort of genders left out. Um, hermaphroditic characters left, right and center. Yeah. Hermaphroditic characters left, right and center. And then if you sort of, if you're prepared to tolerate, not, you know, the idea of, of gnosis kind of weaving its way through Christian mysticism, um, you know, mystics are all very sketchy about which gender's what and who it belongs in or whatever. I mean, St. John of the Cross legendarily wrote about his soul as feminine with respect to Christ being masculine and um, wrote love letters to Christ, really. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, his soul being kind of wooed um, by Christ as a kind of gallant suitor. And that's really common in mystical poetry to take that kind of view. Um, there's lots of female mystics that write about themselves in the masculine gender and so on. So um, it's all a lot less kind of because Gnostics and mystics tend to be, you know, the, the transformative experience of life gets you outside what's normal, what's normative, what's conventional. Um, and so these kinds of transgressive sorts of ways of speaking are, are, are much more common, I think, than they are in, in mainstream and orthodox religion, um, which takes its shape largely to reinforce and... Um, Reinscribe the normal parameters of, of ordinary life for for people. There you go. There's some things. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. Yeah. Uh, on that. On that. Uh, on that subject. Also, I th I think that the, in a very real sense, the the way that the Gnostics treat the body as less important. Um, 
you know, for, uh, on whatever part of the spectrum of <laughs> less important you want to you want to take that. I, I think that there's um, it's it, it it can be reassuring to a lot of people. I mean, it's no secret that uh, the the Joe and I Church has a disproportionate uh, amount of LGBTQ persons uh, than, I mean, maybe statistically speaking, than probably every other religious tradition in the world. Um, yeah, statistically, if you're going to break it down, least, capita could be, yeah, any at, other. At least more that are out, anyway. Yeah. Well, that, okay, sure, that's oh, yeah, true, too. Point, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't want to point fingers, but, you know. <laughs> right, and I, I, I don't want to speak for anybody else's experience and, and anybody else's, uh, you know, feelings about why they belong to a certain tradition or, or not, but it, it's, I think it's important for me personally that there be this kind of ambiguity, ambiguity towards the body um, that, and those kinds of issues that, you know, the, the Yes, they exist, and yes, we have to deal with them, and the tools of the world are the things that we have to escape the world or to transcend the world. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, everybody has the same spark of the divine. Everybody has the same um, goal, really, in everybody who's in this tradition anyway. And, uh, and the external trappings are less important. Yeah, yeah, I think it's massively important. Mm -hmm. A big, it gives a lot of space and freedom to be able to um, find a place for yourself in all this, I think, and to um, to explore where you do fit mm -hmm. rather than having to decide, you know, sort yourself as fitting in or not fitting in right. up front, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Well, that'll do it for part three. In part four, we're going to talk about some esoteric anatomy and some spiritual practices associated with that. We're going to talk about the emotions and where do they live? Are they in the mind? Are they in the body? And we're going to talk about some energetic experiences of those emotions and how they kind of manifest within the body and within the physical world. And then just at the end, a brief conversation where we pretty much solve the problem of reincarnation. So uh, you're not going to want to miss that coming up next time on Talk Gnosis. If you really liked what we're doing here, don't forget to subscribe. You can subscribe on our YouTube channel or on our website, GnosticWisdom.net. You'll find all the relevant links there. And if you found this content valuable and you'd like to support us in some way, please visit our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Gnostic. You make a small pledge and then each time we release something, uh, it, it'll uh, charge your card just a tiny little bit at the end of the month. And uh, every little bit helps and uh, your support would mean the world to us. So go and visit us over there. And for everybody who is watching along at home, we'll see you next week.